Hi, thank you uh, for coming to this second session uh, of today. There will be two talks in this session. Uh, the first one will be one made by uh, Marcus Neteller about crisis, and the second one will, will be uh, done by myself. We will try to keep the time so we can switch to uh, the other um, conference easily. Uh, the first talk will be uh, done by Marcus Neteller, which is uh, was a researcher in Italy for 15 years and now works in his own company called Mondialis in uh, Germany for four years. Uh, thank you. It will be uh, the state of grass, uh, Jay's project. Uh, and I saw there is a lot of grass people, so they don't do their homework. So thank you. The floor is yours. So hello, after the lunch break, um, welcome to this uh, State of Grass GIS talk. It's of course not only my talk, but we have uh, further Grass co-authors here, sitting over there, Vero, Martin, uh, and Moritz are also here. The others are somewhere else uh, and not participating in the conference. So what I would like to report on that um, you know, Grass is uh, probably the oldest open source GIS which exists uh, to our knowledge and uh, that now accumulates to 20, uh, 30, sorry, 35 years, um, which is quite a while. But what I want to show is that uh, things stay dynamic, that of course uh, some of the decisions which have been taken already back in the early 80s uh, still pay back, pay back even nowadays. For example, the modular and lean structure which is a big advantage when it comes to cloud processing, means if you have uh, huge amounts of data you want to process, then you are really happy if you do not have some overwhelming technology which eats all your resources just by running. So this is something which has been already done uh, or decided back then. And the main concepts haven't been much changed. So as I mentioned, uh, I as the the question is, of course, what does GRASS stand for? So we wrote it there. It's a geographic resource analysis support system. That's the name, which is still the original name, not modified at all. Um, still the same, uh, 35 years plus, the modular and flexible uh, structure of it already mentioned. And Im most importantly, of course, that it is open and free software, uh, which made it also one of the founding members of uh, OSGO back in 2006. So let's say we were eligible to be part of the party and as you have seen, it turned into something which lasts. We have now uh, a huge conference here with all so many attendees and so forth. Uh, this is quite amazing. If you look back into history, you'll see it there um, on the right side, the, uh, the old hardware that were the systems uh, on which uh, GRASS was originally developed. Um, you find it probably in the museum. I, uh, in 2014 in Portland, I got one of these tapes with uh, the GRASS version 3.2 on it uh, from 87, so that physically still exists. And uh, yeah, and nowadays, as you know, we have a lot of community around. We do these code sprints and so on. Uh, and yeah, it ever evolves in our view. So for those who are not familiar with GRASS, just in a nutshell, what you can do, you can process uh, raster data, but not only the normal two-dimensional raster data, but also voxels, which means uh, volumetric pixels that are like cubes. And with that, you can, for example, describe uh, soil moisture or atmospheric conditions and so forth, and do everything in a rasterized space, but uh, in 3D. Then GRASS comes with a topological vector engine uh, that's different to the uh, rather well-known simple features, uh, which means it's, it's a different representation of vector data. Imagine two adjacent uh, polygons. In a topological model, you do not have two lines, uh, in the, which are the common border of uh, these adjacent polygons, but you have only one. And the advantage is that, of course, you cannot have the gap and sliver problems. You may know from simple features. Then it does image processing, and most interestingly, very relevant for the Copernicus Sentinel program, or the LASA Landsat, or Cybers, and so on. 
uh, as the time series support. Time series are supported now for a while, and you can have time series or manage time series for raster data and vector data. So it's not only limited to satellite data, but it's quite generic. You can put in your climatic data sources. If you have a sensor network, you can also manage those data, study uh, the evolution of land use in vector space and so on. And it comes with a rich tool set of different uh, functions in order to analyze those time series to fill gaps and so forth. And eventually there are visualization options uh, in terms of cloud computing, what I will mention further on, uh, you do usually do not have a display, but you have all means of putting, uh, let's say, visualizations into files, generate them, and then use them elsewhere, or you get them into uh, web infrastructure whatsoever. The software is portable. That means it runs on more or less any operating system. So not only Linux, but also Windows, uh, Macintosh, uh, Android, uh, probably, if you uh, want so, maybe for uh, field uh, versions and so on, that you can do some small in situ component uh, analysis. Uh, this is all possible. And um, graphical user interface we have. You can also use it through uh, QGIS. You can link it to R. You can link it to many programming languages. And there is the command line as well. And later on, I will show also some cloud integration. And this cloud readiness is something we have been working on in the last year, let's say, one or two years, to make Docker images available. So on Docker Hub, you find uh, ready-to-use Docker images, GRASS with Python 3 and PDAL, for example, or uh, uh, a full implementation of GRASS as an Alpine image with only 80 megabyte size, if you want something small, um, and so on. So just take a look. Much of the background of GRASS comes from science. Uh, it is not a science-only project. It's not only used in academia, but also in companies. Um, but there's this scientific reputation. So we got uh, the idea, why not have an auto-generated profile of GRASS development team in Google Scholar? And uh, don't remember this. We started uh, last year, I think. Uh, you can see it filled up to quite a few citations. So at time, it's 34,000 citations. And we did not manually uh, uh, find them, but this you can automate, of course, with keyword selection. But uh, it shows you that there's plenty of uh, citations, but also original material being published, which means the idea is if a new method is implemented, there's also the background to understand what, um, yeah, what the, the methodologies behind are. So we try to, let's say, keep it uh, peer-reviewed and so forth. Okay, now a block on uh, Grass GIS is big data ready. That's of course a buzzword, as we all know, but um, in the end, uh, everybody, not everybody, but many of us struggle with the problem that the data are growing non-linearly. So if you take, for example, the Landsat archives, they were already pretty big. Now with this Copernicus Sentinel archive, it goes into the multi-petabyte range and so on. That means if we want to analyze time series, it always accumulates. But also, if you do high-resolution autophoto analysis or land use mapping or drone data processing, whatever, you end up easily with lots of data. So what we have done to address this, to make it a bit more simple, because in the end, there are two approaches of, for example, uh, calculating things in parallel. You can either modify your algorithms to then uh, compute things at low level in parallel on different uh, CPUs, nodes, whatever it is. Or you, uh, if, it, if the topic allows, you can also go for uh, tiling your data, as it is done also in WebGIS, and then send the individual tiles to different nodes. So it means you have a large map, you can tile it, and then you can uh, compute it separately in parallel. Or if you have the opposite, you have the tiles, and you want to have one virtual view on it, and you don't want to deal with all these individual files, you can create a, a VRT, like in GDAL, and uh, make a virtual layer on top of that, and then just operate it as usual as a single map. So both directions are possible. We have added a new compression. Um, this compression came, uh, was published some years ago, and uh, is getting picked up quite uh, quickly in different software packages. 
we were maybe one of the first in the OSGO world to uh, implement that. The advantage is the access is much faster than with the standard deflate Z-lip compression, uh, and also the compression rate is better. So basically, win, kind of win-win. Um, and then it depends on your data size, of course, if you even realize it. But with large, large amounts of data, it becomes interesting. To my knowledge, also available in, in GDAL and in uh, probably also in GeoTIFF. I tried to find Eva here somewhere, but uh, maybe he told about, talked about it before. So concerning memory handling, um, there are two approaches available now. If you have, uh, for example, watershed modeling of a um, very large uh, watershed or large watershed is high, at high resolution especially, uh, if you have nowadays a lot of memory available, you can do the computation all in RAM. But if this exceeds your resources, which of course happens, then you can also switch to a disk cache mode. So we have both uh, options, which means that the limitations of um, uh, dealing with large amounts of data is more or less kind of solved. Of course, there are still limits, but uh, it's pretty impressive now what you can do. And this is a low-level change we did in the library in order to uh, offer this all-in-memory cache for uh, families uh, of uh, algorithms like the cost path routing, point cloud binning. So if you are doing rasterization of point clouds, for example, stream and flow computations, uh, segmentation, interpolation, and so on. So you see it's now uh, available to a lot of commands within GRASS itself. So I already mentioned the... Docker images, you find on the website uh, a list of uh, available Docker images. You can see there is a downloads, 8,300 downloads already, so it's nothing which is just in a niche, but apparently interests a few people, so um, just go there. You can also take the Docker file, customize yourself, and then create your own uh, collection of tools with that. Okay, talking about uh, Sentinel again. We say that uh, GRASS is now Copernicus ready. We have a tool set of Sentinel data, uh, Sentinel modules available. They include uh, the download of data. So you can say, this is my bounding box. Uh, for those who know, uh, GRASS.js can be the computational region. And then you query, okay, what data are available with this maximum amount of clouds? And uh, for example, in this time range, show me the list. And then you can also go and download that. This also works for uh, uh, Sentinel-1 data. Then especially for Sentinel-2, we have uh, uh, the import function then. So all the data are stored in a directory. And then you just bulk import everything with a single line. And it already creates uh, the time-space registration. Uh, so uh, it creates a kind of time-space cube that is metadata management for the temporal grass extensions. So the, you can then go and aggregate, for example, or compute the NDVI over time, or compute the maximum NDVI in a, in a season, or whatever you want to do. In addition, there's atmospheric and topographic correction. So topographic correction means, in this case, if the terrain is undulated and you have shadow effects, you can use an elevation model and kind of flattening it radiometrically. And eventually there's cloud detection and masking in order to get rid of partially clouded areas. If it's fully clouded, then it's probably useless to use those data anyway. Um, we already had a workshop this uh, week by Moritz Lennart and also a talk yesterday about object-based image analysis. It's a full chain now. Uh, from the very beginning, you take the raw data. Different sources can be origin from LIDAR, LIDAR scanning, from drone data, aerial, whatever it is. And then you can go through and do all kinds of, um, uh, apply all kinds of tools. Especially, uh, we got new tools for segmentation. So they're so-called super pixels, which are kind of pre-grouping of segments, which are statistically similar image segmentation with parameter optimization. So you can run it hierarchical, means the output of one run you can reuse in the second run and further improve uh, your segmentation. We have um, different machine learning options. The first one is uh, to Python libraries in that regard, and the second one to R. So we connect, of course, also to other software packages in order to, to get the best of all worlds. 
And uh, there's a talk later today about artificial neural networks in grass. Um, please come there if you want to learn more. The author is sitting over there. Um, what's most important and was really a big topic for us, the Python 3 support. So uh, if you're familiar with Python, you may know Python is end of life. Uh, Python 2, of course, is end of life uh, very soon. Uh, in a few months, Python 3 is uh, alive. And so uh, it was time for us to finally catch up with that. But this catching up took really a while. We started it as a Google Summer of Code last year. But if you look at the numbers here, you see we have uh, uh, something like uh, 750,000 lines of code. and. Uh, amount of 30% is Python. So we had to revisit something like 230,000 lines there, if they are Python 3 ready or not. And of course they were not. And so we had to spend quite some time on getting things done. Um, the first release candidate has been published recently. Now we have the code sprint on Saturday and I hope to get out the, the final 780 there. I know also QGIS people are here, and in order to uh, better package everything and have the interfaces right, we do need that, and that's what we have been working on. You can also try Grass online. Maybe not all of you are aware of that. There are these Jupyter notebooks available with Python and with Bash that are examples you can, of course, clone and use yourself. What does it mean? There's a button on this web page, so it's on GitHub. This is by Václav. Uh, uh, Peter's done, and you can uh, launch the session there in the browser, and then it looks like something like this. So you can read it, you see the code, you see uh, what uh, would come out, but you can also uh, run it right in the browser. You select a line and say, go run, and then it sends it in the, uh, sends it in the back end to the cloud, and the results are given back. So it's really an interactive session here and very nice to study. And if you want to try something else, you just go and edit these lines there and go on with your computation. Then uh, already presented uh, by Carmen Tavalika on, I think, Tuesday, no, on Wednesday uh, this week, the Actinia uh, REST API around grass. That is a new community project. It became community project in spring of this year. So you find the information on the OSGO website. Um, and that is something which enables you to run grass functionality in a cloud infrastructure. So basically you have different nodes with, uh, with grass, GDAL and PDAL and what you want installed. And around that is this layer of uh, Actinia, which is doing the REST API communication. And so you can then uh, contact the Actinia server and send your request there, the REST requests, and then uh, go back from that, uh, retrieve the results as resources and so on. So if you are interested, there was a talk on that and the material is online. For this, we added a JSON uh, support so you can turn each command into a kind of process chain. So this is not really a chain, but a single command, but you can chain them and then send this stuff to Actinia and it will do the computation. Uh, for Grass users, very interesting, there's the Actinia command execution. This is basically using such commands, but sending them from your current session on your laptop to the cloud, and then it will be executed and you retrieve back the results. Uh, you can then do single commands. You can write a kind of shell script and send it there, or Python script and so forth, uh, and then communicate with the cloud infrastructure, which you can deploy yourself or you use services out there. Uh, see the link for a tutorial. Importantly, um, we did also the, finally the migration away from SVN. Uh, SVN to G G Git migration, we went and picked uh, GitHub for this case. Um, we have two repositories. One is the master, which is the Grass 7, also with the seven release branches there. And we did uh, the homework and go back in history, uh, back to Grass version 3.2 from 1987. Remember, I have this tape. Honestly, I had a copy already, uh, but uh, we, I didn't have to read the tape for that. But we did all the reconstruction of the commits. That's why you see also back to 87, uh, these 20,000 something commits there. We also moved the um, add-ons there. 
But if you look into the details, and that's, uh, we are a bit proud of that because that's really a software uh, history here, what you can uh, look at, and you can compare to uh, the master. But this is the old master, which is class six. Remember, we also have seven, the new master. Uh, but you see all the differences, and you can see what happened between 1987 and 90, uh, 2016, actually. So last commit there, um, 1991. Um, and this one was all taken from the file stamps, uh, which we tried to be preserve over the last 25 years. So now it's more or less safe in a Git repository. So this used to be an animation with the Grass community sprint people. It's a PDF, so nothing moves here. Uh, this was the code sprint. Uh, we have frequently code sprints. The next one is on Saturday. Please come if you can. Uh, this time we focused on SVN to Git migration. And um, we also work on so-called image collections. This is interesting for image processing. If you have multi-channel data like Sentinel, Landsat, and so on, you can treat it like a group of channels, and you also know which number is which band, and so on. OK, the last slide is uh, the new website we are working on. We had already above yesterday. Uh, the actual website is not modern anymore. It's not responsive, and so on. Uh, we will come up probably also in a matter of hours or days uh, with a new prototype of the next web page. It's already tangible, let's say, in a hidden repository, but um, we try to move the major content over, and then uh, you will enjoy a modern uh, view on the good old GIS. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>